Hello everybody. Hello there. Hello there. Hello there. Hello there. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 788. That is 788 of the Agostino Zynga Show, courtesy of I, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 788 for my Espanol speakers out there. What's going on? What's happening? What's crackalacking? How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing. How am I? Not bad. I can't lie. I'm not bad. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty fine. I'm feeling pretty, you know, well hydrated, well rested. I've been working out a bunch, reading a bunch, so you can see my skin looking shiny and shit. I've been minding my business. Not really, but you know how it is. I'm getting there. Little by little, I'm getting there, minding my own business. That's why I got no pimples or spots anywhere i'm not sending out any bad vibes so i've got no wrinkles my hairline's still where it needs to be but i just like wearing hats so i'm living well i'm feeling free and i'm having an absolute blast and i can't wait to have a blast with you lovely people here today so what we're going to talk about so many things to talk about today so many things to dig into we're going to talk about twitter hiding the likes we're going to talk about fashion stuff we're going to talk about electronic music we're going to talk about music we're going to talk about culture we're going to talk about sneakers we're going to talk about all those things that you love to hear from the number one cultural commentary podcast in the world holler if you hear me welcome to the show number one thing to talk about today number one thing to talk about today why are people so sensitive why is everyone such a baby? Why is everyone such a B-I-T-C-H? What is going on right now? I say this to say, the whole blocking thing is something that's always fascinated me, especially on social media, because I feel like the block feature should be reserved for people, I wouldn't say who harass you, but there's there are people who kind of can be annoying reply guys or reply girls who were always, I see people in some people's replies, who were always trying to like, I wouldn't say even contradict you, but they're always trying to one-up you. They're always trying to remind you of your faux pas. Oh, you didn't pronounce this word correctly. What does that mean? You said that last week. Then you're saying this. There's those type of people, right, that always are in people's comments and stuff, nitpicking at things. That's the word, nitpicking. Those people deserve to be blocked. Because it's like, look, I hardly know you. I don't even know you. You're a random person. Leave me alone. You're kind of harassing me. You're l slightly stalking me. But when somebody has their own opinion on what you do or who you are from just an outsider perspective, they're a nobody to you. They don't matter. They have this snapshot opinion of who you are, what you do. Maybe they have an opinion on an interaction with you that maybe didn't go the greatest. Maybe didn't go the greatest. But they're quite you know, reasonable in how they discuss the, the the interaction. They speak about the interaction as representation of like the overall climate when it comes to quote unquote celebrity interactions and how weird they can be, especially when it's in like a micro niche sort of area type of thing. It can be hard to sort of like pass. They talk about it from racial point. They talk about it from a gender point of view. They really are being as fair as they can be. And they're extending a lot of grace. They probably shouldn't extend because if you look at it just from the snapshot, that interaction was a, you know, a piece of, a piece of crap, a piece of doo-doo, you know, that other person was, you know, being a B-I-T-C-H, they're allowed to be, but they were being it, you just say this, you vocalize this on your very, very, very tiny, minuscule, non-mattering platform, and again, you know, I, I hate the whole platform thing, oh, you're platforming somebody, blah, 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 you can say and do what you want, you're not obviously immune to the consequences, but the idea that, you know, people's opinions on their social media feeds or on their tiny podcast is equivalent to somebody writing a hit piece about you in the New York Times, it's just dumb, the comparison isn't the same, but let's just say that this is a quote-unquote platform, cool, it's tiny, it's small, it really doesn't matter, especially the grand scheme of things, where you have like a gazillion fans who love you and appreciate you for what you do, and then you have one person who says, oh, you know what, I met them once, or not met them, but I bumped into them and it didn't go too well, and then you take that interaction as them saying they don't like you, or they don't rate you, or they hate you, I don't know what people, when people, I, I don't know, I don't know how some people interpret when people say things online, because I think it's, it's a hard thing, because when you, when, when you say something to somebody, you can't then be in charge of how they receive it, 
doesn't matter how well-intentioned you are. So you can be as kind as you want to be, gracious, reasonable. They can just hear something from you, the tonality, your face, the combination of the tonality and your face, what you say and be like, mm, I don't like that person, block. Cool. But it's really odd because if anything, it shows like, it's almost like they're trying to say, I don't want to have anybody speaking about me or in my direction that isn't just giving me unfettered praise that isn't just feeding me grapes in a flipping jacuzzi and it's almost like life doesn't work that way though but then i guess that's probably the what they're doing because life doesn't work that way at least my social media feed i'm going to curate it in a way where if you ever if you even breathe in my direction the wrong way you're going to get a fucking block button and i've only noticed it happening since i started to do the podcast more consistently and since i started to use twitter more consistently like legit like i don't even at people when i say some stuff on my twitter because it's not necessary i'm just literally saying it for myself and it's just me expressing whatever comes to my mind and obviously on this podcast i'll say whatever i want to say and again i'm a, it's a very small audience i'm speaking to some of my episodes don't even get fucking double digits for instance right this is like and like nobody gives a fuck about what i have to say i'm literally speaking into deep space but sometimes <laughs> these people will see these things and like it I don't know if it gets to them or if it's more so of just like of a keeping your peace in. Because I don't want to take, I don't want to think of myself too highly like, oh, what I'm saying is getting somebody because that's not my intention. I'm just sharing my opinion, sharing my point of view, sharing my love, my interests, whatever stuff that I'm into. And to be completely honest as well, this whole thing, even social media, whatever I do online, it is a little bit of a selfish pursuit. I really don't care if anybody watches or doesn't watch like genuinely. And I think a lot of people who've kind of watched my stuff in the beginning can attest like you go back of four years or so, I've got videos on my channel that have like one view and it's me ram ranting for like two and a half hours. I honestly don't care if anybody watches. I really don't. This is almost like therapy for me because I don't have real people to speak to. I get to speak into this microphone. It's a bit sad. I understand. But this is what works for me at the moment, especially being a working class immigrant, poverty stricken black male. This is all I can do. This is all I can afford. So I'm just going to speak into this microphone and I'm going to let my feelings go. And when people receive it, they receive it the way they receive it. But to suggest that to, no, to just to think that some of the things I say on here would affect somebody who's like winning in life, doing what they want to do, living life on their terms, and they decide to be like, oh yeah, block. You're an. That's like. So now, what am I meant to do? Am I meant to be a fan of yours still? If you block me, can I still be your fan? Can I still come to your shows? Or is that counter kind of stalking? Do I now have to pretend like I don't like you when I do? But you just decided that you don't like what I said and you went. Let's say, <laughs> you know what I mean, and I, and I and I've never understood it personally because, like I said, I think blocks should be reserved for those extreme cases where somebody's just being super annoying and constantly pestering you, right? But for somebody that has like a difference of opinion, or for somebody that has a different view of you, and you know who you are, it boggles the mind. But it comes from my point of view because you know, I I I honestly haven't blocked a single person in my entire life on any social media feed. But then again, I'm one of those weirdos where I wouldn't want anyone to know that I'm that pressed. That's part of the reason why I'd never block anybody. Do you know what I mean? I would never want you to like know that you got the one up on me and I'm thinking about you and I went to your profile, I clicked the three buttons, I scrolled down. No, 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 no. You're not going to get that far. I'm just going to ignore you, pretend like you don't exist, but I'm not going to go to that point of view. But the people that do that sort of stuff, it's like, Really? really at your like level this is like necessary it's better for someone that just has like a different pov a different no they're not pov i'm not gonna because people you know kids nowadays use that term wrong but just i just find it fascinating i truly do find it fascinating what's going on in the world right now where people are so sensitive they're so fragile that they legitimately just can't handle somebody just having a different interpretation of it and, it, and it's not even like what i said was fact what I said, and again, I'm not going to go into detail. You know what? I'm, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But it's not even what I said was fact. I said it as like, this is my interpretation of that interaction. It wasn't a fact. And I put loads of caveats in it. Hey, I could have been high. Hey, I could have been drunk. Whatever. I could have come across a certain way. Men, women, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I put all these caveats that I probably didn't need to put anyway. I put those caveats. If I'm being honest, I put those caveats maybe partly because I thought that person might see it. And then they might be annoyed. So I want them to know that, hey, I'm an ally. But then that still wasn't enough. 
So it goes it goes to show really and truly there is no need to like, you know, put kind of guardrails or kitty gloves on some things that you're gonna say. Just say what you wanna say because people are gonna receive how they're gonna receive it, which is okay too. Because you know, communication is two way. Just because you say something doesn't mean just because you say something with good intentions doesn't mean somebody should receive it with good intentions. They're allowed to receive it however way they receive it. But I just find it odd when you're when you're making the effort to just to be to sound reasonable, to sound like a quote unquote good guy, but then somebody thinks they hear what you say and they're like, no, not a good guy, fuck him, blocker. It's like, okay, I guess. And then I've noticed it more so now, especially on Twitter. Because again, I just say what I want to say. I send out my bat signal and I just keep it moving. And then you'll go, you know, because I'm on like fashion Twitter side, you know, music Twitter side. So there'll be friends I'll be reading. And they'll be looking at the Freddy, be like, oh, this person, da, da, da. I'll be like, who the fuck is that? You search in, the, you write their name on Twitter. And you're like, oh, this person's blocked you. So like, I don't even know who you are. Like, I don't know who you are. I've never directed a tweet. Like, I'd, I'd rarely at people unless I'm, like, replying to something they're saying. So it's like, I don't even know you. <laughs> you saw something that I said and, like, nope. <laughs> I find that so funny. I find that so funny that someone could just read something you said about somebody else that has nothing to do with them. And they said, oh, I don't like the way he sounds. I don't like the language he used. Man, man. People are such babies, bro. Such babies. But, you know, that's probably the reason why social media isn't as fun as it used to be. Because in the past, it used to just be like, you know, that's probably why Twitter's quite fun as well, to be fair. For all the errors that Elon Musk has done, Twitter's fun because it is a bit of the wild, wild west. You can say some flagrant stuff, you know what I mean? You can drop the, the hard, you, could, you, could, you can drop the N-word with a hard R on there and no one's going to fucking bat an eyelid. And I think that's the beauty of it because it's just a bit, it's a free-for-all. Um, most platforms aren't like that. Everyone's kind of sanitized. You're afraid your account's going to get locked. You're going to get restricted. Blah, 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 bound to spend. It's like, bro, like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I found that stuff fascinating. But again, I guess, I guess in some respects, maybe some people could say, oh, maybe I'm underestimating the reach that I have. I don't think that's true. I just think, unfortunately, I happen to have interest that align. I happen to be interested in things where people are the most sensitive unfortunately i didn't know that to be the case but i guess that's the case unfortunately my interests are also the place where people are the most sensitive but then the most sensitive people are also the most creative because you have to tap into that sensitivity that emotion to get that work out you know that's kind of part of the game but i don't know i just noticed it the other day i was like look i was like oh shit <laughs> I'm like, what am I meant to do now? Am I meant, am I meant to pretend that I don't like you just because, like, it's almost like it's a weird thing. It's just, it's so weird. It's a fascinating thing. It's weird. I don't get it. I wish it wasn't the case, but you know, I've always said before, like, as soon as you involve somebody else in like a communication, they're free to do with it what they please. So if they see anything, because there's, there's a, there's an opinion that I kind of do agree with. Well, I think I heard somebody, a girl in particular describing why she blocks a lot and i think it was something like to protect your peace as in i think i mentioned that point before it's like okay the world is fucking chaotic you could have some man across the road screaming all sorts of profanity at you you could have these horrible situations that you're in but this platform that you can control and that you can safeguard why not do it you know if somebody's chatting shit or you don't like the way they fucking you know uh, format their sentences you don't like the way they use a certain word you don't like the tone block why not you know it's your own platform anyway it's your own social media feed you want to see what you want to see so why not cultivate it and um, prune that you know that fucking bush in the way that you want it to look so that makes sense but it's just funny when you just say one thing you know one thing one pov one story one one interaction you describe your point of view and someone sees that as um as like a indictment on them as in like oh i'm saying that you're a bad person you're evil it's like nah it's just if anything it was a bit snark if anything it was a bit snarky maybe a little bit unnecessary to include the person in that story that in the post that i originally mentioned because i was talking about somebody else maybe but again i'm free to say what the fuck i want but then they're free to do what they want to you know it is it's, it's to and fro but i just find it fascinating fascinating that we live in a world where people are just incapable of like taking in anything that isn't licking their ass it kind of reminds me a lot of the comedians in stand-up comedy industry 
or in a stand-up comedy scene that I cover on The Random Show, which should be coming right after this show. But on The Random Show, when I cover a lot of these comedians, a lot of these guys and girls, you almost get the feeling like they really don't want the consumers, the viewers, the customers to say anything back to them. They want you just to consume. Hey, I've got a show. Buy my tickets. Hey, special. Watch it. Hey, podcast. Tune in. Hey, this link. Click it so I can get um referral fucking whatever. Like, that's all they want. They don't actually want to hear from you. The only time they want to hear from you is when they're doing crowd work and they want to mock you for their entertainment or for the entertainment of others and to benefit them. They actually don't want you to like, oh, you have an opinion or you have a you have like a feedback about my pod or you have a funny comment to make about my special. They just take it like it's always negative. It's like, bro, like, so this communication is only one way. It only serves you. Like, yeah, of course. So, okay. Interesting. 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 But yeah, what can you do, it? What can you do? I guess it is the nature of the game. So, moving on from that rant and talking about Twitter. Recently, just the other day, Elon Musk decided, Elon Musk decided in his infinite wisdom to make the likes on Twitter private. Now, don't get me wrong. I was never somebody that went out of my way to check somebody's likes. But at certain points, if somebody was like, if there was a particular topic, like imagine the Drake, you know, the Drake dick pic, whatever thing leaked, right? Somebody probably didn't want to share it on their feed and they'll be like, oh my God, Drake's pictures leaked. Check my likes. So that would be the only time I would like use the whole like function on someone's profile. It's almost like their way of like having a public bookmark section type of thing, right? But I also didn't know that there were some people out there that were using people's likes as like recommendations. One example being Jay Versace, right? He's like a, he used to be a big on, on Vine. Um, he used to do skits and comedy stuff and whatever, maybe. But now he's like a full blown producer. He produces like loads of great stuff for like legit hip hop artists and stuff like West Side Gun and whatever, maybe. Um, but he's known to be a fan of, um, of pornographic material, let's say. And I didn't know until this like thing became private that people were using Jay Versace's likes as like a referral, as like a place to find like good links for porn on Twitter. So I guess that whole like thing is like a whole other world of Twitter that I wasn't really engaging with because again, I didn't really give a fuck. If anything, my main f function that I use likes for is almost like an approval thing. So somebody writes something back, just like it. If they write something about it, I agree, I like it. But then I use the bookmarks as something to say, like, you know, I use bookmarks as bookmarks, something to, that I could kind of refer to later on if I want to read it later or want to cover in a pod, wherever it may be. But I guess some people are using likes differently. Or, of course, if you're a woman and you want to keep tabs on your guy, likes are really, really important, especially on Twitter, because you get to see what type of degeneracy your guy is getting up to. But I did notice myself, I'm not too sure if you guys noticed it, but yesterday or the day before, I did know, especially on my feed, I noticed, I think, an influx of selfies from, like, baddies. And again, you don't really get that a lot. If you use Twitter, you know what I mean. Twitter's not really the place for, like, oh, my God, look at my face. I'm a 10. You can't have me. It's not really that kind of place. It's usually a place where girls might show a full body picture or something, working out the bum shot, but you rarely get a, like, oh, my God, look how hot I am selfie. But I saw an influx. I saw almost an immediate influx of like selfies from all of these attractive women. And then I also happened to see that they were all being recommended to me because somebody else liked them. You know, they weren't really people that I was following. I was like, oh, this shit worked instantly. So I think the girls realized that this was going to be a good thing for them because your engagement, because I'd imagine if you're a hot girl, it might be a little bit annoying if you post a selfie of yourself on Twitter v Instagram because Instagram is more of a like double tap place. Twitter is a bit like no one wants to be caught out because if you like something you're not meant to like and your partner goes on your profile, you're going to be in big trouble. You're sleeping in the fucking doghouse or you're sleeping on the couch or you might have to fucking move home completely. So you have to be fucking careful and move with caution. But I think ever since the likes have become private and judging by this graph that Elon Musk posted on his social media account, it looks like people are now more free to like because they know their likes aren't public because uh, it, according to elon you can still see your own likes on your own profile but if somebody clicks on your profile they can't see your likes but then i think somebody did ask him and he said maybe it might be an option they might do in the future they might enable it as an option so you can toggle so you can have your likes displayed have them not displayed up to you kind of thing 
Um, but I think they do that also. I think even on, on Twitter, you can decide to like toggle off your media or whatever it may be. But it's been insane to see over the last day or so, people now liking loads of like first traps, you'd say. And the girls responding and just bombarding the feed with fucking first traps and all the hot and all the quote unquote hot gay guys are also bombarding the feed. I, I'm almost getting like an avalanche of just like attractive people just flooding my ins my Twitter profile, which wasn't the case usually. Usually on Twitter you get people like posting, I don't know, attractive people can kind of get away with posting like lifestyle things. Oh here's me in a car, here's me in a beach, here's me in Rio with my Brazilian t-shirt on. But rarely on Twitter there's a whole like selfie thing work. But I've seen tons of selfies now. So I wonder. I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm curious. Will Instagram see this and also copy it? Because I don't really use my Instagram at all these days, apart from like checking DMs or whatnot. But I wonder if, because I noticed before I stopped using Instagram, I was using most of my stories. But I do notice whenever I do log back into my Instagram, the story section is always popping. There's always somebody posting something. I, I think the majority of people, so, ooh, ooh, I said that weird the majority of people post Instagram stories. So could Instagram improve their overall engagement if they removed public likes and just had it as a counter? Like, oh, you got 1,000 likes, but you couldn't see who liked the thing. Would that be a thing? Would that be a beneficial thing for Instagram? Will people then be more prone to liking more pictures and would they engage more with the content if they know that no one's going to see a Agostino Zinger like this blah, 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 because that whole shit gets people in trouble you know it does right especially if you're married and shit and you're liking a post that you're not meant to like or liking a post that looks bad if you like it maybe then that encourages it so maybe this in a way isn't even a good thing as a feature maybe this just encourages adultery maybe like hiding likes is gonna be one of those things that exponentially you know, damages households, breaks up families because people are now going boop, 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 boop. And maybe we're going to reach a point where vindictive baddies are going to get back at people, guys especially, who pissed them off by posting their likes and be like, motherfucker, you oh, you calling me ugly, bitch. Well, you weren't calling me ugly uh, two weeks ago and they have a screenshot of like you liking their post and they can go through it and you see like a million of their posts. Like this person like 10 plus of your posts. That might be a thing going forward. I don't really know, but I found it fascinating. Um, everybody's celebrating. I also found a meme on the other side really hilarious where people are basically saying that be careful what you like because Elon Musk is so temperamental. He could decide next week to change it and then suddenly all your likes become private, right? Because I think that's what happened to that feature called Circles. I think it's Circles. There was a feature on Twitter where you could basically post stuff kind of like a private, kind of like a private feed for your close friends. And when that feature got removed, all of those posts were smashed onto your fucking main feed. And people had to like quickly, frantically delete them because a lot of them concluded nudes and, you know, other like Finster type stuff, whatever it may be. Because um, I've noticed that too. Now that we use Twitter more, I've noticed people are, are using Twitter more like a Finster. So, you know, all of the kind of stuff that's on the cutting room floor that doesn't get posted on Instagram, finds its way on Twitter, but it's usually the more like, oh my God, like fucked up shit that you probably don't want your work to see. So let's see what happens going forward. Let's see what happens going forward. So next on the news here, we have to talk about Ayrton Hogg at Man United. We have to talk about Ayrton Hogg at Man United. So as most of you guys know, um, the news broke over the last few days that Ayrton Hogg is now is now confirmed as a United manager for next season. They're discussing a new contract with him and all that sort of malarkey, which to me makes zero flipping sense. But I guess because he's in his last year, it probably does make some semblance of sense to let him have some level of job security, I'm assuming, going forward. Um, considering how badly we finished the season in eighth place, despite the you know FA Cup win, it does seem very odd. It does seem very odd that they would keep him in his job. But when you think about it a bit more, it kind of makes sense because this is the easier decision than it would be to fire him, try and find a new manager and hope that goes well. So for me personally, I feel like last season was an unmitigating failure, unmitigating failure. And the, the really disappointing thing about last season's failure was that it was a reminder for me, at least as a United fan, that there is no quick fix. There is no saving us. The only way we're going to get saved is if the sporting side of the club, the structure is fixed and the only way that I thought it was going to be fixed is if we get new owners. That didn't happen. The Glazers sold us down the river or they pulled a fast on on us. They intimated and suggested that they wanted to sell the entirety of the club. 
Then they decided last minute not to sell the title to the club and only sell a small portion of it and then only sell a portion of it that they would give the partial owners control and sake of the footballing side. So it's almost like they listened to the fan backlash against the Glazers. Fuck the Glazers. Hope they fucking, you know, burn in a volcano somewhere. They listened to the backlash from the fans, but they refused to leave because why would they? It's um, the main is a good cash cow, but they relinquished control of the sporting side and gave that to Ineos Group to handle that. Because I said, hey, you guys think we're useless at the sporting side. We've had 10 years of failure. Here, here we go. But what they did that was really clever. They sold a portion of the club to Ineos at an exorbitant rate. I forgot what the exact figure was. But essentially, what they did was really smart is that they suggested that they wanted to sell the whole club for a particular amount. Let's say six to seven billion. But then they ended up selling a smaller percentage of the club for like four billion, let's say two to four which then would mean if Ineos wanted full control of the club, they would eventually have to end up paying more than the six billion that they said that they would sell it for. So in a way, you know, by fucking us over, they also got the maximum amount of money, which just goes to show how the Glazers move. They take out dividends. They do the okie doke with the fans. They sell a portion of the club for an exorbitant fee. And then, you know, we end up in a situation. Cool. No worries. When Ayrton Hogg was prospected or proposed to be manager of United, I was a big fan of his and I wanted him at the club, like a lot of fans. But I didn't want him at the club because of the trophies. I'm not too sure if that's the case with other fans. I have never thought that United are going to suddenly wake up tomorrow and become league challengers and Champions League challengers. I never thought that was the case. I thought because of the 10 years of failure that we've had under the Glazers' ownership post Alex Ferguson retiring, we have a long way to go. Other clubs have taken over. Other clubs are in the incend. Uh, other clubs are, are, are on the ascendancy. So to suggest that one manager, one player, could come in and fix us, and overnight we could compete in with the likes of Man City, Liverpool, and Arsenal, is quite preposterous and almost foolish. You also, you have to take baby steps, and I thought a good baby step would be to get a manager like Ayrton Hagen. He's clearly a good coach. You saw what he did at Ajax when he was there. Um, the, the, the specific thing that kind of popped in my mind is the game that Ajax had in the Champions League away to Real Madrid. I think that might have been like 2019 or something. Amazing, right? You're like, oh shit, just you know, how they're popping. Um, no, it, might, it, it can't have been 2019, but probably before that, but whenever it was, they were popping Real Madrid around the park. They were playing at the Bernabeu, completely ripped them to pieces. And I think they ended up winning 4-0 or something. It was a way much in the Champions League. A brilliant performance. And for me, I was like, okay, cool. If you're not going to be competing for the Champions League, if we're not going to be competing for the Premier League, can we at least play some good football? Can we at least have some entertaining games? Can we at least score some great goals? Can we at least just have a fun season? And then kind of progress from there. And my kind of long-term thinking was, like, okay, cool. You get Ayrton Hagen. He implements a good style of play. He coaches the players. He gets rid of some of the old deadwood that we had as club that have been fucking clogging up space and just been stealing a living. And then maybe the manager after him is the one that takes us to the promised land but i never thought it would be him i never thought it'd be a quick fix but at least we played good football that didn't happen he comes to united we played terrible football especially last season um the games that we win sometimes we don't deserve to win them falling out with players we still got a bunch of players we shouldn't still have at the club like the maguires like the mctominay like the aaron wambasakas who are still here stealing a living right and then in the end we end up having one of our worst league finishes ever we break all sorts of negative records like goals, you know, shots conceded and, you know, fucking, you know, points difference and goal score difference. All these horrible records that we, we break. But then we win the FA Cup at the end of the season. And to be fair, to be fair to the guy, the FA Cup win was incredible. It was unexpected. We did beat Man City soundly. Doesn't matter what the excuse is. Oh, Man City were on the piss the day before because they won the Premier League four times in a row and they were celebrating. Everyone went back to fucking Jack Grealish's house and were doing balloons and shit. Doesn't matter what the excuse is. Man City are the best club in England. Maybe one of the best clubs in Europe. Maybe one of the best clubs in Premier League history. And we demolished them in the FA Cup final. That doesn't need to be excused or whatever it may be. But I don't think that one victory can brush over or excuse how poorly we played for the entirety of the season. Same way how one result in the season shouldn't get him fired, even though the, the loss against Crystal Palace, any other top manager at top club, losing 4-0 to Crystal Palace, you're getting fired. So it, it's kind of confusing. And then add to that, add to that, my own feelings aside, the club were clearly interviewing people. 
That's the thing that kind of boggles my mind. I've never seen this happen before, where they, where a rumor gets put out or uh, information gets leaked before the FA Cup final that Ericsson Hug is going to get fired, whether we win the cup or not. Then it comes out, oh no, that's not the case. We're going to assess it, but still they don't deny. Cool. And throughout the entire time that Ineos has been here, they have never publicly endorsed Ericsson Hug either. Cool. Whatever. Then he wins the FA Cup. And instead of, if you're clever, instead of just announcing him, because I think if they would have announced that Ericsson Hug is staying immediately after the FA Cup win, even fans like myself, you have to just suck it up and kind of move on. It is what it is. That good feeling, the vibes of beating your bitter rivals, you kind of have to just put your hands up and be like, okay, cool, fair play. But they didn't. They wait, 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 which makes you think they are assessing their options, interviewing people, and then they are publicly interviewing, not publicly, but it's being well known that they're interviewing people like Thomas Tuchel. It's well known that they're sounding out people like England manager Gareth Southgate. And then they turn around and say, nah, we're going to stay with this guy. And I almost think to myself, like, if you're Ericsson Hogg, you almost have to feel like they're taking you for a dickhead as well, a little bit. Because they never wanted you really. And they kind of, it seems like they're settling for you because they don't trust the other options or because the actual person they really want isn't available right now. And the suggestion is, if you read some of the accounts from In The Know People, and it's been a rumor that's been floated from early too, by the way, they really want Gareth Southgate. All of the fans, myself included, I don't want Gareth Southgate anywhere near this club. Look what he's done, doing with this great, almost world-class generation of England players. He's fucking wasting them, right? Not picking the right players, um, terrible fucking formation one of the good things he's done with england to be fair to Gareth southgate he has restored the good feeling the players do look happy going to play for england i don't really know how much that has to do with him or to do their personalities but regardless he has cultivated an atmosphere uh whatever feeling around the country around them when they go into extra duty where they really do enjoy playing and they're not as weighed down by the pressure of the tabloids and the fans great but as a coach come on Gareth Southgate isn't Man United level at all. He probably still has to prove himself at a club once he does leave the England role. But he, he shouldn't prove it at Man United. He should start like a, at like a Crystal Palace level club, at like a Brentford level club. That's where he should start to try and get his way up again and to kind of, you know, repair his reputation, especially after um, his stint at Middlesbrough. But they have been talking about Gareth Southgate for a long time. So you have the feeling that they really wanted Gareth Southgate He's not going to, I think he's made it very clear, he's not talking to any clubs until after the Euros. I don't know why he says that anyway, because he's acting as if like loads of clubs are clamoring for him. I don't think that's the case. But regardless, it's almost as if they're like, they're giving Eric Tanaka the job as a placeholder almost. And of course, if it goes amazingly well, fair enough, you keep him. But if it does go as badly as it went last season, you've got a guy who's ready to go in fucking January, if need be. So it's a confusing situation. It really doesn't make any sense to me. I feel like it's a backward step. I feel like it's the easy decision to make because, again, the hard decision to make is to go out and interview some candidates who aren't maybe the typical choice, who aren't maybe a guaranteed choice to win trophies, whatever it may be, and stick with that and then also be judged on your results, on your pick. Because now, you know, it's almost like they don't have their own man in. They have someone else's man, but they're also not going to be judged as harshly as they would be if they got their own guy in, like a De Zerbi, like a Poch, like a Tuchel, whatever it may be. So it is a bit of a cowardly way out. And if anything, it does fill me with a little bit of like worry about this Ineos operation. They're kind of moving glazerish. They're kind of moving glazerish. You know, they're not really, there's, apart from the Omar Barada thing, they don't seem to be clinical. They don't seem to move with intent. They don't seem to move with clarity. Everything's kind of drawn out and, you know, group exercise. Everyone's, it's just, I don't know. I'm getting a bit of glazer feelings from these group people. I don't want to say that, but that's what I'm feeling. The article courtesy of Sky Sports says as follows. Eric Ten Hag will stay on as United manager. United and Ten Hag are said to be aligned after the club's end of season review, a process which lasted longer than two weeks and saw other managers sounded out for the role. However, the conclusion from the review was that Ten Hag should remain in charge and negotiations have begun over a contract extension for the Dutchman. I think it's insane to finish eighth in the Premier League. Could you imagine the Premier League over 30 plus games? That is more of a representation of what you've done than a trophy. That's why big managers, that's why managers of big clubs get fired after winning the Champions League because they finished second in the league. It doesn't matter that you won the trophy. That's a one-off game. 
What did you do over 30 plus games? We finished eighth. And this guy keeps his job. Chelsea finished above us. And Poch got fired. It's like the math ain't mathing. It continues. Ten Hag's current contract ends at the end of next season with the club having the option of extending it by a further 12 months. United finished a disappointing eighth, their worst finish in the Premier League history, but beat rivals Man City to win the FA Cup, Ten Hag's second trophy in many years. And that, I think, is something I have to give the guy credit on. And I think it's something that he sussed early on. Because I guess my thinking about the club and where we're at isn't what the, everyone else thinks and feels like. Because the fans as well online, some of the Ten Hag fanatics are weird, bro. Because I'm a fan of Man United. I'm a fan of Manchester United. I'm a fan of the badge. I'm a fan of the club. No individuals. I don't care who you are. Bruno, whatever. I, I, I don't give a fuck. I'm a fan of the badge first. So whatever's best for the club is what I'm a fan of. But there are fans within our fan base who kind of idolize, look up to, love Eric Ten Hag, the managers and the players more than the badges. It's, it's a bizarre thing. Anyway, that being said, a lot of those guys have this whole like trophies, trophies, trophies thing. They see how bad we are. They see how poorly we play. But I think a lot of them feel like if we win trophies, it's okay. I don't think that's true. And I think that they're full of shit. Because when Mourinho was doing it, playing his haram, jihad football, parking the bus, everyone wanted him fired. He was winning trophies and we were playing horrible football, but people didn't want him. So because of Ayrton Hag, what, has an affable face, because he's bald like Pep, I don't know what it is. It's not even like he's charismatic because he isn't. He speaks like he speaks like he's speaking through a, vo a vocoder or something. He's a weirdo. He's not the most charming dude in the world. Fair enough. But I don't know where that affection and that love comes from. It's very, very bizarre. But to give Ayrton Hag credit, I think he noticed something that I didn't notice. The fans are full of shit. The fans like to say they want to be patient. They want the club to kind of build slowly. We have a long way to go. We're not as good as Man City. Like everyone says the right things. But I think deep down, some of our fans believe that we're still the same club that won all those Champions Leagues, all those Premier Leagues, all those domestic clubs under, under SAF. They still think we're the same club. They think all it's going to take is signing Harry Kane, signing this player, and then suddenly we're going to be challenging. That's why I think they think. That's why they want to win trophies, because they still think we're like the big dogs. When we're not, we're clearly still a far way away from there. We finished, I don't know, I, I, I can't think of the top of my head, but I'd imagine in the last 10 years, we haven't finished in the top four often. So the fact that this is now becoming one of those things where people are like kind of bragging about, I think Ayrton Haag was very clever in that he noticed that the club are full of shit and that everyone wants us to play good football, but really what they want is trophies. So what he did is that he won trophies. He took every cup competition serious, even in the League Cup. He never really rotated a squad. He played a full strength squad. Bayinda, the second choice goalkeeper, didn't get a sniff of the first team. Um, when when um, when Onana had to go to the African Cup Nations, um, Ericsson Hart made all kind of, you know, um, efforts to get Onana to stay for as long as possible and then send him out to the African Nations when he had to. And then Bayenda played like one or two games after that. He never saw a first team again. So Ericsson Hart took all those cup competitions seriously because he knew one of them would stick. We won one last season. We won one again this season. So he's kind of proving everybody right, wrong because they say we, they want us to build solely, but they want trophies. And then the trophy is what saved his job in the end. Because if we didn't win the FA Cup against Man City, I don't think they stick with him. I don't think so. I think the FA Cup completely changed everything. And I think that's very short-sighted and very reactionary to take one game against your bitter rivals in a cup final while, you know, especially off them coming off the back of winning for a record fourth fucking Premier League in a row, it seems very, very, very short-sighted to give Eric Tag that job in that regard, especially considering how badly we played for the entirety of the season. But again, I could be wrong. Tenag had to contend with injury-ravaged squad throughout the season, but managed to salvage Europa League qualification with victory at Wembley. The review concluded that Ten Hag deserves a chance to show what he's more capable of within a new sporting structure implemented by Sergio Rekas Ineos taking charge of football operations. I can agree with this last, last section. I can agree with that. There is an argument to be had with Eric Ten Hag being given the grace and the opportunity to work under a proper football structure. 
I've spoken about football structure ad nauseum on here. It's probably one of my favorite fucking phrases. Football structure, style of play. I love to speak about those kind of things when it comes to United because we're devoid of both. But to be fair, top managers have said, and I think Jose Mourinho made a good point of it one time when he was a pundit on, I forgot what show he was on, but he was a pundit on some show and they asked him, oh, what's your opinion of like Pep and Ergen Klopp? And he said, it's perfect. Like, I'd love to work with a club that gives you the full trust so you can do your job. And he basically made the comparison that, you know, Liverpool at one point went three years without winning a trophy and FSG never sacked Klopp. Um, Pep, whenever he doesn't like a player, Man City will go out and sign a, a replacement instantly. So they got the full trust of their club and their board. The structure is in the place where they try and do everything to maximise the success of the football team and do everything to please the manager. So Oz Mourinho was saying in a roundabout way, if I get given that structure, if I can work within a structure like that, anyone could be successful. I can be successful. And I feel like with most of our managers, especially post Cyrus Ferguson, a lot of them could argue that part of the reason why they weren't successful was because the football structure was non-existent. So maybe if with Ineos in charge and with certain people coming in place, with Scout, Football Director, blah, 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 maybe there is an argument to be had with if you just let Eric Ten Hag coach, maybe we'll see a different Eric Ten Hag and we'll see a different United team. But I would then say no, because we saw him coach because he was the coach last season and we played terribly. So I'm not too sure. Maybe we'll see a difference, but I'm not too sure. I don't think that's something that's kind of like whatever. But hey, what do I know? But the interesting thing to me, the interesting thing to me is how this whole played out, right? How this whole thing played out. Let me see if I can find it. There we go. How this whole thing played out is almost as interesting as him staying. And this is courtesy of the account called Mina Ibrahim. Big up Mina Football. And she has broken down what actually happened. And this is from the Athletic article, which was behind the paywall. But she was nice enough to kind of write it up and give us an idea on what actually happened and how Ineos got to the decision of like keeping Eric Ten Hag. What this shows to me is a lot of indecision and a lot of backtracking and almost a bit of panic thinking. It doesn't show a group that kind of knows what they're doing and is going to put their, you know, their mast in the sand and kind of go from there. It's almost as if they're like not too sure what to do. And for me, it's given me a lot of glazerish energy. But again, I could be wrong. So this is courtesy of Mina Ibrahim, Mina Football on Twitter. She says, very interesting out piece in the article, in The Athletic, sorry, about how the decision to keep Eric Ten Hag came about. Spring 2023, Ineos planned for the 2024 season, 24 and 25 season, with Ericsson Hag involved. Cool, right? That was initially when they came in. After the 4-3 loss against Chelsea in April, Ericsson Hag was left out of meetings, including the decisions to part away with Varane. So in your start to make decisions about the footballing side of the club, as in, hey, Rafa Varane's player profile, he's too injury prone, he's too old, let's move on from him. But Ericsson Hag wasn't consulted. So they're already planning for the future without this guy as early as that 4-3 loss against Chelsea. May 14th, force of letting Ayrton Hag go before the Arsenal game was discussed after the 4-0 defeat at Palace, which was a disgraceful performance. Disgraceful. Because Palace aren't even that good. Losing 4-0 to a club like Palace is, you know, is sackable in itself. So they were considering sacking him as, as of May. They were considering to sack this guy. The plan was to part ways with him at the end of the season. Before the FA Cup, a meeting with top executives included Sir Jim Ratcliffe, um, Brailsford and Blanc and Wilcox took place. This was after the Carrington review of Wilcox and Brailsford where they met with every player individually. Discussions on plans to bring in or attempt to bring in a new manager drawing up a shortlist that included Poch, Tuchel, McKenna, RDZ, but also discussed other names like Amorim, Marco Silva and Roberto Martinez. So the club, the, honestly, this, these people are clueless. They discussed hiring another manager with the players individually before the FA Cup game. So maybe the players put that performance in knowing that this guy was going to get fired. And then out of the blue, it changes. <laughs> Imagine what that first training session is going to be like back. It's going to be so awkward because they all thought he was leaving. They all kind of, you know died on their shield, so to speak, because they wanted to give him a good send-off and because they wanted to give United fans something to cheer out for once at the end of the season, as Bruno Fernandes said. 
and now he's still there. Woo! Especially the players who are like, oh, I'm only going to stay if, if, if Ayrton Howe goes. The likes of Sancho and stuff, they're going to be so pissed. Southgate was liked because of his positive environment. He has created, like, honestly, man. Why, why are we are cursed? We are cursed. These people wanted to hire Southgate, not because of what he does in terms of coaching. Not because of how he's developed players. They wanted to hire him because of the positive environment he has created at fucking England. What, because he gets them to sit? in different seating orders in a cafe because they have to sit on the table and not use their phones. You want him to be our manager. Concerns about Michael van der Gaag and ETH remained loyal to his number two. That you have to give ETH credit for. They wanted to get Michel van der, Ga Michel van der Gag gone, but ETH gagged them and said, nah, that's my boy. If he goes, I go, but I'm sticking with him. Props to Eric Hag for that. After the FA Cup, emotions of Wembley was put aside by our SJR in Brailsford. And you could see it, bro. Honestly, I felt so bad for Ayrton Hag. When they were giving the trophy in the stands and the ownership were there, they were so cold to him. It was so awkward when they hugged him and congratulated him. It was so weird. But when Pep was there, it was all like hugs and blah, blah, blah. But when Ayrton Hag came there, their manager of their club, they were so weird with him. So... Again, it must be a weird position for Everton Hawk to be in because he knows he's not wanted by these guys, really. They've only stuck with him because the options available aren't necessarily that much better than him to justify sacking him. And they're scared that if they make the decision to sack him because he's a quote-unquote fan favourite, especially after the FA Cup win, if it goes wrong, they're going to get hounded out. And they don't want that. So it's almost like a, oh, let's avoid getting harassed and getting bullied and getting shouted out on the internet. Which again is dumb because whatever. <laughs> ah, they met with Tuchel Poch and was already out of this race on the job in the first week of June. Discussed our ideas with RDZ, but didn't align with any of group. Flew to Ibiza to deliver the news to ETH, who was aware of the process but was not worried. I've never seen this ever in football. Usually in football, I'm not sure this happens in regular workplaces, but usually in football, when a manager gets fired, they usually have other managers in place they want to hire but they don't interview them out of respect to the person they've already got in the job. They might sound them out. They might put the feelers out to an agent and say, hey, is your client available? But they're not going to interview the person because it's kind of in poor taste. When it does happen and there's pictures and they get caught, it always is really embarrassing because it's not, you know, it's not the kind thing to do type of thing. But I've never known a process where a manager is currently at the club and he knows that the owners don't really want him they're actively interviewing people for his job while he has his job and he's okay just to like chill because the only example i've seen is with um Tuchel at Bayern Munich allegedly the story goes at Bayern Munich that when Tuchel when you when Munich made a decision to fire him towards the end of the season before the end of Champions League game he was obviously shocked and it was obviously a little bit of a surprise to decide to fire somebody before such a you know crucial game why don't just do it at the end of the season but they decide to like, they're not going to, you know, he's not going to stay next season. They lose obviously the Champions League final to Real Madrid. But then during the process of that time between like them announcing he's not going to stay next season and then after the, you know, the loss, they were interviewing people, but they couldn't find anyone that was the right fit or the person that they wanted wasn't available. So then they went, allegedly the story is they went back to Tuchel and said, hey, would you mind actually staying with us next season? And allegedly he said no, because you already, you know, like he took it as a disrespect that they fired him before the end of the season. And then they had to kind of settle for Vincent Company, who's still a manager, has a lot to prove. So that shows you that, you know, most regular people would see it as a bit of an affront. You fired me, and now because you can't find an adequate replacement, you now want me to stay. Like, go fuck yourself. But Ericsson Hogg didn't mind. Like, he's clearly, like, happy. Like, you know, the salary's good. Man United's good. Like, why not? He's happy just to, like, stay and let them interview people. And you just sit there and, and hope that, you know, he's, 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 he's basically in Ibiza with his wife having dinner and enjoying couples retreat you know, and hoping that the people that they interview fuck up their interviews. <laughs> it's just a weird thing, isn't it? Like you're just sitting there hoping like Tuchel fucks up and stutters, you know, um, Roberto De Zerbi forgets his USB stick and can't present his PowerPoint presentation. You're just hoping they fuck up so that you keep your job. It's a very, very strange thing to be in. But like I said, um, I'm shocked by it still. I still think it's the wrong decision personally. I think fundamentally... I think it's very wrong to reward people for subject performances, especially in the league, 
the fact that we won the champion, sorry, the fact that we won the FA Cup Champions League, but then we finished eighth, I don't think removes how bad that eighth finish was. It doesn't eradicate or take away from that finish. So the fact that he keeps his job because of a trophy, a one-off game, is kind of despicable. And again, it's almost rewarding m mediocrity because it means you can just, what, like fuck up the league, fluff the league, put the fans in pain, have us screaming and shouting at each other on Twitter spaces, be angry and play horribly. But then towards the end of the season, when it becomes pragmatic time, he can be he can be Mr. Pragmatic and get us defending as a team and attacking as a team. So it shows he could do it, but he chose not to do it at the beginning of the season. I don't know, man. I'm a little bit pissed by it. But again, what can I do? I'm just a single person out here screaming into the void. I'm just a single person out here screaming, screaming into the void. Nothing truly I can do. I wish there was more I could do. The first thing I do is get rid of the Glazers, but that ain't happening anytime soon, is it? So what can we do? What can we do? Moving on from that one, let's talk about this post courtesy of the New York Post regarding all of these artists who are really struggling to sell tickets. And I find this phenomenon interesting because I feel like I noticed this a lot more because of the random show, which will be coming after this show, by the way, because of the random show where I cover loads of stand-up comedy shows, stuff and whatever it may be. I have noticed this thing where there's a segment of people or there's a particular type of person that enjoys the illusion of like being a big deal without being a big deal. Hey, I sold out this place. Hey, tickets nearly sold out. Hey, hurry up and get your last minute tickets. They enjoy the rush whatever it is that that brings and i never understood it because i don't know who you're lying to so if you're saying you're selling out places but you're not obviously the people in the business they know because the business people that work in the industry they all talk agents managers venue owners whatever it may be they know who's who they know who's doing what and what's happening so you lying on social media and saying that you sold out somewhere when you didn't or you trying to book a big place that you think you can feel and you can't, you're not lying to anybody in the industry because the industry knows what I want. And then to the fans, I don't think we care, especially if I don't go, I don't give a fuck you sold out. But if I do go and it's half empty, I also don't give a fuck because I'm there enjoying your show. So who is the lie for really? You know, it's for people that aren't really going to be a fans. People are just going to be sitting there observing and be like, oh shit, that person's a big deal. Look at them, man. They sold out. Blah, blah, blah. But in general, it doesn't matter. Anyway, all that to say, a lot of these artists, I feel like, with the exception of Bad Bunny, a lot of these artists, I feel like, have refused to acknowledge the shift in people and how they go out now. Because I've noticed it in terms of nightlife. I've always said the pandemic basically killed the club, club scene because everybody, especially in London, the majority of people, I feel like, who were the ones that were holding the club scene up with their bare hands were the foreigners the people who'd recently moved here my my brothers and sisters from spain france italy and other parts of europe they were the ones that were legitimately holding this scene up and the moment the pandemic hit especially because it devastated parts of you know central eastern and you know mediterranean countries obviously in europe i feel like a lot of those people then rushed back home to look after people or because of the pandemic and life was so shit here why stay here and pay a thousand pound rent for a single room when i could go back to my parents in the sun somewhere and chill while this pandemic is happening you know what i mean and a lot of people just grew up so a lot of those people that were around are just not around anymore they've either moved back home to their native countries they've moved out of london or they've just moved on from going to contests and gigs and you know club nights or raves whatever it may be so because of that, a lot of these artists, Jennifer Lopez, Bad Bunny, Justin B, Justin Timberlake, they've lost a portion of their fan base. Those fans are never going to go and see them again. So I think you have to kind of adjust now your expectations of what you can sell because there's just a finite amount of fans. And, and you also have to count, there are artists that have popped during pandemic. One, one that comes to mind, because I'm thinking of peas, is Pink Pantress. Pink Pantress kind of blew up during the pandemic. She's now got her own fan base. So all those people popping up have now taken a bit out of their fan base. So I feel like if you're Jennifer Lopez, if you're Justin Timberlake, you can't book shows how you were booking shows in 2005. Because those fans don't exist. They might not be your fans anymore. They might not want to come out to see you anymore. 
But those fans aren't there anymore. You don't have that level of fans. Only certain people still have that level of fandom anymore. Most people don't. So you have to kind of adjust. But for some reason, in the entertainment industry, adjusting your expectations or let's just say booking a smaller venue that can, you know, just to kind of make sure that you sell out and whatever it may be, is seen as a loss. It's so bizarre because a lot of these people could easily book a thousand cap venue and sell it out and it's fine but they want the perception of being a big deal. So you book the massive theater, 2,000, 5,000 plus, you do 12 dates and then you're surprised you can't sell 40% of the tickets. It's like, bruh, there's not, the people aren't there. Just adjust your expectations and you're fine. But no one wants to do that. And then you end up with the most embarrassing situation, which is you having to cancel the entire tour. So, you know, if you adjusted your expectation and took home a little bit less bacon, you could have had a good show. You could have a good tour. You could have had good content come from it. You could have touched and seen your fans. But now you have to have the embarrassing thing where Jennifer Lopez and you have to talk about your family. It's like, we've never heard Jennifer Lopez talk about her family. The only thing she seems to care about is Ben Affleck and her six pack. And all of a sudden she cancels tickets. Oh, it's my family. I need to hang out with them. Bitch, you don't, you don't even care about your family. You can't look the way you do and care about your family. You can't be 50 years old with a visible six pack and biceps and you care about your family. How are you getting that? How are you getting that body then? Come on, man. It's just, I don't know. Anyway, New York Times, New York Post, sorry, article. Jennifer Lopez, Bad Bunny and Justin Timberlake are struggling to sell concert tickets and here's why. Jennifer Lopez can't sell concert tickets. Um, nor can artists like Bad Bunny, The Black Keys, Justin Timberlake, pink according to reports even coachella was reportedly more lackluster than previous years yet taylor swift is holding the profitable concert tour in music history and beyonce kills it whenever she's on the road continuing while not all um while not all artist issues are the same they do seem to be some universal themes impacting businesses there are a lot of concerts going on in the post-pandemic world ticket prices are climbing and it's not easy to obtain tickets the average ticket price for the top 100 tours in the first quarter was a record 123 dollars according to data from concert ticket um tracker poster cited by business insider and therein lies the problem you've got average artists who are probably past their sell-by date, trying to charge you $100 on average. Really and truly, who's fucking worth $100? Really, nowadays. I say not many people are worth a $100 gig entry price for a ticket. Because you have to imagine, that ticket price doesn't account for anything else. Doesn't account for a babysitter if you've got a family. Doesn't account for parking. Doesn't account for your food, your drinks, new outfit. Doesn't account for merch. Just going to a concert nowadays might cost you a cool $500. That also doesn't include if you bring a partner, if you go with your kids, just to see your favorite artist perform for an hour and a half, screaming over an MP3. You're paying $1,000. God damn. Um, plus, artists may be overestimating their appeal. Exactly, like I said. They're overestimating their appeal, especially nowadays. Like, look at Justin Timberlake there in this picture. That's an older Justin Timberlake. That's an older man. He's even he even looks different. He's standing on stage with a, with a guitar. He's not wearing a backwards cap. He's not like all like you know wiggerish and shit. He's grown up. His music is a bit different too. Bro, change your expectations. You don't have the same wrong bunches crowd anymore. Why not just change your expectations? Have it be a little bit more of an intimate show. Smaller numbers. You could all you could even spin it like, oh, I want to be closer to my fans. I want to give back. You could sell it that way too. But nah, they want their cake and eat it too. They want to be like different artists, do different things, but they also want the same level of attention they were getting when they were in fucking NSYNC. It's like mm, that isn't gonna happen, bro. Anyway, continuing. Last week, Live Nation announced J Lo's tour was cancelled, and the singer and actor was taking time to be with her family and friends. Bro, I don't even know if J Lo has friends. Anytime I see J-Lo on my social media feed, she's just, you know, harassing Ben Affleck. He looks like he wants to fucking unalive himself whenever he's with her. But I never, ever get the feeling that Jennifer Lopez hangs out with her friends and family. She seems quite singular in her pursuit to maintain her looks, to keep acting, to keep singing. But it's all about the brand J-Lo. So to somehow suggest that now she wants to take time to spend with her family. It's like, no, it isn't. There is no family. You just didn't sell any tickets. So now you're using your family as a crux. It's almost like, do you remember at work? I think some people have done it. 
I can, you know, ashamedly say that I have done it myself. I'm sure some of you guys could admit it. There are some times where maybe you are, you know, a bit worse for wear and you can't go in that particular day and you decide to do the most unforgivable thing ever. You decide to call in sick. Not only do you call in sick, you maybe go for a card that you also have to reserve for a special emergency. You can't overuse it. It's only a one hit card only. You say to your work, somebody in your family died. It's fucking bad to say it, but we've all done it. We've all done it to a certain level. You're not ill, nothing wrong with you. You, may, you might be hungover, you might be tired from, you might have jet lag, whatever it may be. You just can't be bothered to go in that day. And you call and you say, somebody in my family died. And you know when that, those words lip, leave your lips, someone in my family has died. You know when that words leave your lips, you now have to create a whole family member who hasn't died. Or maybe you have to remember that somebody died two years ago and you have to keep that lie up. It's a horrible thing to say because once you said it, you now have to like, you know, never not say it. And that's one of those lies that you just can't use again. So JLo's used her family card once. She can't use it again. Okay, it's your family? All right, cool. Next time when you do a tour and you can't sell, you can't tell me it's your family again. The family excuses run. It's done now. It's flipping over with. So it's one hit and done now. But anyway, there was speculation that the issue was that the pop diva um, was a crumbling marriage to Ben Affleck, but sales of her latest album have been weak and the companion film on Amazon Prime got panned and J-Lo's planned Vegas residency is also in jeopardy. That's really dumb. I feel like the Vegas residency for J-Lo should be a success. She should probably put more of her chips in that corner or put her eggs in more so in that basket. I think she would kill a Vegas residency. Or, or Red and Sea, as Brendan would say. I think she'd kill it. It continues. Um, it obviously got the Black Keys there. Um, rock duo, the Black Keys, also scrapped a planned arena tour, while Flans flagged that, flagged that some shows for Troy Sivan, Charlie XCX, and The Wallows appear to be undersold, according to reports. Reggaeton star Bad Bunny reportedly cancelled his Minneapolis show due to poor sales. There was source close to his tour, said that the post he cancelled one day, that was only because of extenuate circumstances. There have been murmurs that head under Justin Timberlake and Pink have also been sold to show tickets. The Bad Bunny thing is unfair because he's been on tour for like a year or maybe two years he also does arenas so i think with a person like bad bunny once you see them once do you really see them not it's like beyonce beyonce the reason why her tickets sell so well is because she doesn't tour too often and when she does tour it's for a big album it's a big production's a big thing but are you really gonna see her you know seven times in the same location probably not and every time that you tour you're you know every the, the more frequently you tour the more potential there is for you to like not sell tickets. But with someone like a bad band, again, it's like the scale is just it's on another level. He's literally doing arenas and shit and having fucking hordes of like Spanish people singing every lyric of his song. So I think it's more so the fact that he's been on the road too much um, and obviously collecting their bag and do whatever needs to be done. But I think after a certain time, there's only a certain number of shows you can do when you're someone like Kevin. Like the owner of Team Master clapped back with a spokeswoman saying the rolling, the post that the Pink and Timberlake tours are doing well. She also emailed saying Charlie XS and Troy Sivan sweat tours have multiple sold out dates and it's over 70% sold across four months later. The tickets kick off in September. She said um, they got this year from the Saint last year in addition to coming to every year. I'm eventually full So in general, JT from the City Girls, did an amazing thing, I thought, when she tried to go solo, because she's not that woman, and because the City Girls even aren't that woman either, her team, a genius plan, decided to go to a little new tour in North America, where they live like, stars. Like, it almost looks like they went to, like, um, what's that venue in New York? Um, it almost looks like they went to one of those, you know, like, if you're an indie band, or an indie act, you go to, like, a venue where it's, like, 200 capacity. They, was, they almost picked those type of places. So they were, like, cocktail bars, they were like live music venues, but they were all like places where maximum you could get like 500 people in there. And some of them served food and shit. So people were kind of clowning her for this tour. But when you saw the pictures, it all made sense. Because she's like, you know, a ghetto girl, ratchet girl. Um, all of those places she picked were places where there was a prevalence of, you know, black people anyway. A particular type of black person. And those bars and clubs would play her music anyway. So you go to places where they love you and they like you. They're smaller. So they looked way more packed on the pictures. You get these viral moments of her on stage, surrounded by millions of fans and, and, and friends on stage with glasses on, cool fucking clothes, cameras flashes everywhere. And it looks like you're in an arena, but you're in some small bar somewhere. But then you also get the chance to actually grow and cultivate your fan base slowly. 
people get to see and touch you and feel it. And then when you go on a second tour and you book bigger venues, guess what? Those same people will come out again because by that time you have new material out, you might have a new album out, blah de blah, blah, blah. Oh, hi there. So I had to record this after the fact because the recording itself kind of corrupted. But hey, you know what it is. The majority of the show is still there. So I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Axino Zinga show. This is my tune there at the end. So playing for you underneath my voice should be net spend nothing like you thank you for tuning into the agassino zinger show it's been a pleasure to have your company if you listen to us via the podcast app make sure to leave me a five star review on spotify and apple that'd be greatly appreciated links to the story i spoke about will be in the description links to my socials will also be in the description as well as the patreon thank you so much for tuning in and i'll see you guys again very very soon bye